Mr. Manicor, one of my favorite analog horror creators on YouTube, and one of the best analog horror creators of all time in my opinion, equal to those of the Bandela Catalog's Alex Kister, the Walton Files' Martin Walls, and the Backrooms' Kane Pixels. He's the creator of the Monument Mythos series, which also contains other series within it such as Corner Folklore, The House in the Ocean, and The Nixonverse. He's also made other short films, a now deleted series called The Trinity Desk, and even a collab series called Executive Shutdown with Dan BC Films, and I watched all of them, and when I say all, I mean all of them. <laughs> You've probably heard of the Monument Mythos already if you're into internet horror. Big creators like Wendigoon and Game Theory have all covered them, and you've probably seen some memes related to them in some way. <laughs> but just this year, after finally finishing Season 3 of the Monument Mythos, which I thought was absolutely amazing, Mr. Manicor decided that he did not want to stop there and created another horrifying, mysterious, and very interesting series, and is called The Ningen. And I have to say, it's one of my favorite works of his, if not THE favorite work. I just finished the third episode the day I started writing this script, and it's the last episode that's out currently, and I love it so much. And I've actually watched it quite a lot of times that I even formed my own original theories on what I think is really happening behind the scenes. And I wanted to get it out there somewhere, so I was typing my theories down in the comments, but realized about 30 minutes had passed and my comment was 3 paragraphs long, so um, actually what if I just made a video instead? Also, because I don't think I've seen these theories anywhere, in the comments or in other videos, especially just because it came out, like as I'm making the script for this, the third episode has been out for like over two weeks. And also lastly, the reason I wanted to make this video is because I've always wanted to make a video just around analog horror. Because I always love watching analysis from people like Wendigo and Expo and a lot more others. I've never made an analog horror video before, but hey, I want to try something new and do something I've always wanted to do at the same time, so cool. So without further ado, let's begin. First of all, <laughs> to understand any of what I'm saying, I suggest watching the first three episodes before watching this video, because those are the ones I'm going to be covering today. They're the Ningen 1990 sighting, the Ningen 1991 deep sea video, and the Ningen 1992 ship analysis. They're all the ones out currently as of this video. They're really good, and it would also be super cool to support horror creators so we get more cool horror stuff in the future. So go do that first. I'll give you some time. Okay, welcome back. Thanks for watching the series. How'd you like it? I thought it was pretty cool. And while you type your answers in the comments, allow me to begin a recap and analysis of the whole series for you and for those stubborn people who didn't watch the series first, so that everyone is caught up. Sounds good? Okay. The Ningen 1990 sighting opens with a logo of the Japanese Office for Human Studies. They're the main group or faction that we're going to be following throughout this entire thing. All the episodes are basically from their perspective as they operate around their environment and document the weird things they see. For this episode, their logo appears to be a symbol of a humanoid figure halfway submerged in some body of water. We see a clip of Keizo Fonatsu during the 1990 International Transantarctic Expedition. That is a mouthful. And just like the Monument Mythos where real life people and events are used to tell these sort of alternate history stories, they reuse this concept in this series, with Keizo Funatsu being a real-life Antarctic adventurer, who he composed one-sixth of the men who went on an international transantarctic expedition from 1989 to 1990, where they went from the Antarctic Peninsula all the way to the Russian base of Myrny. Keizo is the team's dog handler as they brought along 42 dogs with them to pull dog sleds to get across the snow. And he has a lot of pictures with dogs and it's actually really cute. But anyways, in this alternate history though, this is where they spot what they call their first human sighting in the Antarctic Peninsula. And this is the first time we see a Ningen. And in real life too, if you didn't know, the Ningen is an actual real life cryptid, just like those of the Yeti, the Megalodon, the Kraken, and those kinds of dudes. It's a humanoid creature that inhabits the water of the Antarctic, and it was reportedly observed multiple times by crew members of government-operated research ships. The name Ningen comes from the Japanese word which means human, like the given of the cryptid for its humanoid-ish shape. There's a lot of sightings and videos talking about the Ningen that I suggest you guys look into. It's really interesting and could give more knowledge that could help uncover the mystery of this series. But for now, that's basically all you need to know about its real-life myth. Going back to the video, we have a really cool sequence where these letters overlap each other, all saying different things. We see the phrases, are we their warm children, hell is real and it's cold, and finally, what will happen when it's warm? We're told that Keizo is the one who gave these creatures the name of humans or Ningen, 
and we're then shown a map of the entire expedition that these episodes take place in. Keizo's son, Hugo Fanatsu, reads aloud his father's journal entry from March 1990, documenting it on video. I went outside to feed the dogs. It wasn't bad at first. Only negative 25 degrees Fahrenheit. And when I left the tent, I was happy. Happy about just how close we were to our destination. But these dogs need my utmost attention now. When I finished feeding the dogs, I turned back to the camp. But it wasn't there. The dogs behind me disappeared, too. A blizzard had arrived, and I was blinded by white from all sides. I couldn't walk straight ahead. The wind was so strong that eventually I was knocked down. I crawled on my stomach, toward where the camp should have been. I crawled and crawled, but nothing came closer. I carried pliers to help unfreeze dog collars and fix broken ones, so I used them to dig a hole in the ice. The ground was so hard, almost impossible to dent. But I dug for hours and managed to put myself in a little ditch. They barely kept the wind away. The wind and snow kept my clothes tight to my skin. I felt Antarctica. Her snow covered me like a mother's womb. I was in the ditch when I thought I heard somebody yelling my name. The storm hadn't let up at all. I heard this. To end the video, the word Ningen is shown on screen with the news report playing in the background. Six men from six different countries and their 42 sled dogs completed the first ever dog sled crossing of the Antarctic continent. The expedition was led by Minnesotan Will Steger. The group traveled nearly 4,000 miles in seven months and temperatures dropped as low as negative 54 degrees. But an expedition like this could not even happen today. Not only have dogs been banned from Antarctica, two of the ice shelves which took nearly a month to cross no longer exist. And that's all from the first video. I think it's such a solid episode filled with perfect levels of mystery, horror, and eeriness as you follow these people to discover something like completely unknown to mankind in a place also far, very far away from mankind. I even thought that it was good enough to be a standalone short film and didn't actually expect it to become a full-blown series, but I love what it's turned into. It's also quite different from other analog videos we've seen before, focusing on characters and settings that haven't really been utilized in the genre yet, and that's super cool to me. We've never seen kind of like Antarctic-based settings and kind of like researcher-type characters in those settings. It's really cool and new, and I love it. Moving on now though, we have the next episode, the Ningen 1991 Deep Sea Video. 
And just like the last episode, this one opens with the logo of the Japanese Office for Human Studies, but instead of a humanoid figure submerged in water, it's now a whale. It opens up showing us the skeletal system of a friendly human or a ningen. Now, a very interesting aspect in this scene is the use of two different languages that give two completely different messages that always contradict the other. Now, I'm nowhere near fluent in Japanese, but I did see this one comment where um, uh, people banded together to translate the text in the background. So I'm going to read those out for you right now. Uh, I'll first read the English text and then the Japanese text behind them for every part of the sequence. And also take note that I might not get all of the text. There may be more to be discovered next time, but as of now, here are the ones that people have translated. First, we have Cranium, an intelligent hunter. Orbit, that's a good eye, which hunts down prey. Nasal cavity, terror from the smell. Or, as the comment says, it probably means it smells fear. That probably makes sense. Terror from the smell sounds kinda funky. Maxilla, that tear flesh apart. Mandible, and the bones. Spine, that turns into a tail. Spinous reversal hunts at the bottom of the ocean. It is very primitive. It is more evolved than any of us. It is easy to evade. It will always outrun you. Feet like snowshoes. Its grasp can kill you instantly. Friendly human, if you wish to meet your family again, avoid Ningen at all costs. Such a cool detail that I didn't even consider to be possible. Because obviously, just like anyone, I thought that the English texts were like a direct translation of the Japanese text. But uh, knowing this now, this just adds a whole new layer to the story that went completely unnoticed by me at first. And it sort of makes you wonder if some kind of party is tampering with the videos to make people believe that the Ningen are friendly when they're actually not. We'll get back to that one when we talk about my theories. We're then shown that the Ningen have actually appeared in cave paintings in Antarctica and that they even predate the story of Icarus by 11,000 years, which, to put in context, uh, I didn't know at first, but when I looked it up, um, that was made in about 8 CE. <laughs> it is now 1991 CE. That just shows how crazy long these guys have been around. Again, we have another secret message in the Japanese text, as the lower line says, our mythologies were their mythologies. Again, keep this in mind for the theory section of the video. Now the next part is the most interesting one so far in my opinion. And oh my god, I am so overwhelmed by the script because I have typed so much words, but I will try to read them for you out right now. We're told a sequence of events through these sort of illustrations, first following mountain humans finding a mysterious corpse on top of a mountain. One of the humans wanders off away from the other people and sort of stares off into the distance, wondering what's beyond the mountain. And lo and behold, beyond the mountain is a whale. And the whale <laughs> turns out to be able to speak. English or Japanese or maybe it's something else. I don't know. But he asks the man, are you planning to jump? The human answers, no, but I envy the freedom of whales allowed by your tails. My legs trap me on this mountain. And not knowing what to say, <laughs> rightfully so, the whale leaves. And without any context as to how or why, um, the human bends their form and leaves the mountain. I'm not- I'm just not gonna question how, as with Mr. Manicor's videos, you just have to like, accept that random shit like this happens all the time, and it'll make sense eventually. But yeah, uh, whales uh, can talk and humans can bend their form. We're then shown the human whale in the water as he finds the whale that he was just talking to earlier. And this leaves the whale speechless, uh, again rightfully so, and filled with hope, or as the English text wants you to believe. The Japanese text says that the whale is filled with fear. So as to which one you want to take, that's up to you. Whatever the case, the whale shouts, follow me, I wish to go beyond two. And they look below them to see a creature that appears to be a fusion of two whales combined into this like one being. The human whale and the talking whale look at each other and mimicking the thing they just saw, fuse together into one being made of two whales. One whale and another human whale, imitating the creature they just witnessed. They then approach this creature, and it appears that it too is able to speak, saying, Follow me. I wish to go beyond too. Uh, our future of the whales that we know, uh, which has consisted of the human that we're following this whole time, are shown going deeper and then eventually diving off a cliff. Then ending up on a very similar, if not the same mountain we saw at the beginning, where it's said that mountain people will find this mysterious corpse. Now this is very interesting, like the moment I saw this scene, I instantly thought that it was time travel.
but I've literally only seen one comment mentioning time travel. So I started to question whether or not this was actually time travel or just some random mountain in the present. But looking into it more, I'm very confident that this really is time travel. Now let me explain. I know that this is the same person and takes place in the past because of the red mark highlighting the character we follow. Only this character has the red mark in the entire story. So we know they're meant to be the same character. And there aren't just two red dotted creatures in two different mountains, you know? Also, take a look at the mountain it lands on once it dies. It appears to be the same mountain, but a little bit different. It appears to be like less eroded, if that's the term. Um, implying that he landed there quite a while before the mountain people found him. Uh, people can say that this is a different mountain completely because it's drawn a little different. But I think if they wanted to tell us it was a different mountain, they would have just drawn it completely differently. I think they intended to tell us that this is the past by drawing the mountain we saw earlier just a little bit differently. But yeah, that's all your honor, I rest my case. Uh, okay, hello, me from the future here. So this is just a r friendly reminder to not take any of my theories or what ifs as fact. And um, just take everything you've seen in the videos and everything that I've recapped as fact. And anything I add on top of that are just purely what ifs and theories and could be debunked anytime. So although I may mention um, a lot of my theories and especially the time travel one a lot, I'm just reminding you to not take it as fact. Um, although I still really do believe in it. This is just mainly for you so that you're not really confused with the series if it's really meant to go in a different direction from what I'm thinking. So uh, only take the things you've watched and the things I've recapped as fact. And these theories that I mentioned are just purely for fun and speculation. So yeah, back to the video. So now, not only do we have sentient humanoid creatures roaming around, but now we have time travel. <laughs> uh, the predeterministic kind, to be exact. There's a lot of versions of time travel used in fiction, but the two versions that are most used and that most know of are branching time travel and predeterministic time travel. Now, let me explain again. God, there's so much explaining to do. I hope you're with me so far. A famous example of branching time travel is in the MCU, where in Avengers Endgame, when the Avengers traveled back in time, instead of altering the future of the timeline they were originally in, they created a separate timeline, completely different and parallel to their own. And this would happen every time someone goes back to the past and alter the events, creating multiple branches in the timeline. So you can't really al alter the events in your own timeline, but you can go back to the past, change something, and create a different timeline completely, depending on the thing you changed. On the other hand, we have predeterministic time travel, which I think is what's being used here. Basically, all actions, all choices, are already determined from the start. You're kind of just walking in the path already made out for you. When you travel back in time to the past, you're the one that causes events that lead exactly into your present, therefore not changing the chain of events and remaining the same as the timeline has always been that way ever since the beginning. Everything is already happening all at once. It's just that we're only able to perceive time the way we do. Just like we see in the story, when the fused whale comes back to the past, nothing changes because they're what causes themselves to get to where they are, if that makes sense. The fused whale from the future ends up on the mountain, leading their past selves to wonder what's beyond, becoming the fused whale and then eventually end up back in the past and start the cycle over and over and over forever. As it was always that way from the start. Everything is already determined. Uh, Mr. Manicor has played with this concept before in the Monument Mythos, with the Air Force One Angel already being in old pictures from the past, despite them not being created yet at that time, as that happens later on in the future. But then when they are created, then they travel back to the past, only for someone to take a picture of them and then be seen in the old pictures. But again, nothing changes in the timeline as it was always that way from the beginning. Uh, he also used the concept of predeterminism and destiny or the lack of free will in the Nixon verse in D-Day Night, where the D-Day soldiers were meant to die in their battle as they had no free will. So with him using this concept before, it wouldn't be crazy to think that he's reusing this concept in the story given what we're told. Unless I'm actually wrong and it turns out to be a branching timeline with alternate universes, again, just like the monument mythos. but. I do not want to open that can of worms yet. <laughs> but anyways, with all that said, we now know that some form of time travel exists. Uh, this concept is not going to return yet as of now, but just keep that in mind as we move forward as it has huge implications and I go into it way more in the theories part of the video. We're shown the human corpse that we just learned about with its nickname being Icarus 1. Now, two things. First, 
The Japanese nickname in the text above it calls it Keizo. I have no idea why so far. It could just be named after him as maybe he interacted with it or maybe even discovered it. Or maybe in some weird timey-wimey way, it is him. I have no clue at all. Now, secondly, the name Icarus is interesting as the story of Icarus in real life is very similar to this one. If you didn't know, the story of the fall of Icarus is that Icarus and his father Daedalus were imprisoned on the island of Crete. Is it Crete? Well, that's how I'm going to say it. Whatever. Daedalus made wings for Icarus to fly away, but ambitiously flew too close to the sun, causing the wax that held his wings together to break, causing him to fall down to the sea and drown. Very similar to this story where the man we follow wanted to escape the mountain and go beyond, but going too deep into the ocean, he ended up falling to his own demise. The same as the story of Icarus, but in this case, the mountain corpse would be Daedalus and the man would be Icarus. And if we apply our time travel theory even, the man would both be Icarus and Daedalus at the same time, with the mountain that they're on representing the island of Crete. And the wax wings would be the wish to go beyond, which takes you high, but if you go too far, you meet your demise. That's deep, bro. Anyways, n now I completely see why they called it Icarus. Very fitting. Hell, this event may even have spawned the story of Icarus in this world. After all, it does predate it by 11,000 years. Who knows? But anyways, after that, we're shown a living human nicknamed Icarus 2, and we see it creepily swim across the ocean. Again, the Japanese nickname is different as it says, removed out of respect to the Funatsu family. Again, no idea what that means, even more so this time. But again, I have a theory, which you'll have to wait for. There's a lot of theories you have to wait for, but trust me, if you stay, it'll all make sense in the end. <laughs> I, I hope. But we're then shown the skeletal system of Icarus 2, just like the friendly human we saw at the beginning. Spinous reversal, a powerful engine, rib cage of cannibalism, shoulder blade, bulletproof bone, humerus, a superior instinct, radius slash ulna, it always, hand, breaks the neck, skull, that remembers everybody. Now I found this term interesting because does it mean that it remembers everybody it's seen, like it has photographic memory? Or is it like Attack on Titan where it sees everybody it's ever eaten slash fused with? So many questions with one line. But finally, once again, we see the term friendly human, but this time the secret text says ancestor of cannibalism. It's then revealed that this new friendly human is actually the second stage of evolution for their species, confirming the text we saw a while ago that said its spine would turn into a tail. And with their looks lining up exactly, it's safe to say that Icarus 2 is a stage 2 Ningen. Although I'm not completely sure what stage Icarus 1 is, could just be a stage 1, although not really looking like one. We then see a question mark on where the third stage of Ningen is supposed to be before the skeleton moves to an upright position. And the screen cuts to stage 3, with hellish red static filling the screen and the silhouette of the type 2 spine barely seen in the background. We're then quickly hit by this scene. The third stage of the Ningen is revealed, and it is terrifying. A Type 2 shed its head and arms to become a giant, spine-shaped serpent in the sky. It then cuts to the Professor Zubov, a Soviet ship, covered in large red words that spell help, help, help. It cuts again to an illustration found on that same ship that depicts this third stage Ningen strangling two people, while another person cowers in the corner holding an axe, showing that this form of Ningen is able to take down multiple men just on its own. Now, whether they're hostile or not is never outright confirmed. It could have attacked these people on sight or the people could have provoked it at first. But whatever the case, this illustration confirms that it is capable of killing. And finally for this episode, we're shown that the illustration on the Professor Zubov eerily resembles a Japanese art piece made in 1844, more than a century ago from when this illustration was drawn. The art depicts what seems to be a Type 2 Ningen, so this could also imply that they're capable of killing, just like a stage 3. Again, it's never confirmed if they are hostile or attack only when provoked, but something interesting can be found through looking at the story of this art in real life. You've probably seen this piece of art before. Um, I've seen it quite a few times throughout surfing the internet, but if you didn't know, 
This piece is called Takayasha the Witch and the Skeleton Inspector, made by Utagawa Kuniyoshi in 1844, just like the video says. Uh, this art piece and many others like it during that time actually draw from traditional stories compiled by Edo period writer Santo Kyoden, taking place over a thousand years ago. These different stories and art pieces have a lot of Japanese history behind them, and I think it's really fascinating and you should definitely look into it as maybe we could get more hints around the series, who knows? But for now, a small detail I noticed is that in this particular story regarding this particular artwork, Takayasha the witch, who is the girl on the left, is actually the one summoning the giant skeleton specter using a magic scroll. Now, at first I thought the piece showed this giant skeleton just randomly attacking people, but it turns out that it was actually one of those people who summoned this thing in the first place. And with this art piece lining up perfectly with the illustration on the Professor Zubov, I think they're implying that this Type 3 Ningen was also summoned or provoked first in some way, likely by the guy holding an axe, mirroring Takuyasha who again summoned this creature who then proceeded to attack the people. Another interesting thing is Princess Takuyasha's reason for doing this. Okay, so there's a lot of stories behind these artworks and a lot more Japanese history around those stories, spanning across the entire Edo period. But I'm just gonna give you one piece of the story that I think ties into the series later on. Remember this for now as we'll get back to it on the theories part of the video. Again, please bear with me, it'll make sense later. So, the reason she did this is because her father launched a rebellion in a province, but it was unsuccessful and he was then killed. Takuyasha was rightly devastated, but wanting to continue her father's rebellion, she ambushed those who opposed her agenda by summoning the skeleton inspector to attack them as seen in the art piece. Now the skeleton specter in question is actually called the Gasha Dokuro, a yokai meaning ghost, demon, or monster of Japanese legend. It's believed to be the fusion of a large amount of dead people whose bodies were not given a proper funeral. And being reborn as these creatures, they long for that which they once had. They're very angry and vengeful creatures and hold a grudge against the living. But did you catch that one detail though? They're a fusion of a large amount of people exactly like the Ningen that they mirror in the video. That was a huge like, oh shit moment for me <laughs> when I looked into this piece. Like that's why he just randomly showed that one photo. That makes a lot of sense now. <laughs> With that knowledge though, it's completely possible that these type 2 Ningen have been around for so long in this world that they've made their way into Japanese literature and are the reason for the myth of the Gasha Dokuro. Which is what I'm calling the type 2 Ningen from now on because it just fits them perfectly. But yeah, what if that's true? Just like the Ningen may or may not have caused the story of Icarus to happen. Just really cool things to think about. Now as for whether they're hostile or attack when provoked, the Japanese legend says that they are hostile and do attack innocent people. But it's implied that they only operate around their like own area and don't venture off too far to hunt for prey. Unless probably summoned with something, just like the magic scroll. Uh, this could be supported by the text that says they hunt at the bottom of the ocean seen a while ago. And looking back at the illustration the art is compared to, it could imply that the Type 3 Ningen may have been attacked first because just as Hakuyasha had a magic scroll in her hands to summon the creature, the man in the drawing had an axe in his hands and may or may not have been used to provoke the creature just like in the story of Takuyasha. Uh, okay, hello. So future me stepping in here once again. Um, as I'm editing this video, I saw a comment that said that the axe dude is actually smiling. And I thought, no way, that can't be real. I zoomed in and that dude is smiling, so yep, I'm pretty sure he provoked this thing now. <laughs> Back to the video. I didn't expect to go that deep into researching and talking about Japanese literature, but <laughs> here we are. That was fun. I finally know what it's like to look into these analog horror series yourself and kind of like find clues that are outside of the videos themselves. Really cool. Back to the video though. It finally ends with the word human, with the man in the background talking about a scientific article. There was an article in Scientific American uh, in the early 70s which compared the efficiency of locomotion for various species of things on the planet. In other words, they measured how much energy it took for a bird to get from point A to point B compared with the energy it took a fish to get the same distance and a goat and a person and all sorts of other things. And they ranked them. And it turns out the condor won. Condor was the most efficient. And man came in with a rather unimpressive showing about a third of the way down the list. That's somewhat disappointing. But someone there had the insight to test the efficiency of man riding a bicycle. 
And man riding a bicycle was twice as good as the Condor, all the way off the end of the list. And what it really illustrated was man's ability as a tool maker to fashion a tool that can amplify an inherent ability that he has. And with that, we can finally move to the final episode of the series, the Ningen 1992 Ship Analysis. Again, just like the previous two episodes, this opens with the logo of the Japanese Office for Human Studies, but again, it's changed. Now being what appears to be the end of a ship floating on water. Hugo Fonatsu once again reads his father's journal aloud, talking about the Professor Zubov. When I could see, I found nothing strange about this image. I remember it well. Professor Zubov. The massive Soviet ship just returned from the Southern Ocean, but across its body a phrase was written, help, help, help. I did not find this strange at first, sad but not strange. I removed my eyes to avoid the truth, but in this blindness, I have realized this was not written by any crew member. They could never have reached. This was not spray paint. Spray paint does not become a dull brown. This doesn't even say help. Not as a verb anyway. It says help as a noun, like assistance or aid. This was a lure for us, a lure that mocked us. Or perhaps they see their treatment of us as assistance, taking us beyond our current state in evolution. Perhaps they consider themselves our saviors. The Icarus II, now in its third stage, descends upon the ship from the sky and merges with it. With this new fusion now being named the Icarus III, now I'll be referring to this new form as a Type 4 Ningen later on. We zoom into the ship and are shown the words Human Factory, referring to this new stage in Ningen evolution. A still working camera shows the inside of the ship and it captures a giant fleshy mass slithering around the ship's hallways, completely blocking the doorway of the room that the camera is in. Hugo Fanatsu once again reads his father's journal, but something is off this time. successful. There were no complications. We all survived. We encountered no injuries and no deaths. We had enough clothing. We had enough food. Our sleds were unharmed and our dogs were healthy. Nothing strange occurred. The mountains were untouched. The ice was unspoiled and the sea was pristine. The journey home was comfortable. We ate well and spoke freely. The ship was clean and organized. The sky was clear. Always. I am ready to join the rest of civilization. I am ready to have a son. We're unsure exactly what happened to Keizo. Was he being controlled by the Icarus 3? Was he driven mad by it? Or could he even be replaced by it? Nobody knows. But the one thing we're sure of is that he's changed for sure. This isn't the same Keizo as the one who wrote the previous journal entries. What then follows is in my opinion the most horrifying scene so far. Just like the story from the second episode, we're shown a sequence of events completely through drawings. It shows a red square, presumably the fleshy doorway we saw earlier, and from it drops another smaller square. It starts to grow small appendages, only starting as one, then two, then three, and finally a fourth appendage. They grow into fully formed limbs, two legs and two arms, with feet and hands. It sits upright, starting to look more and more humanoid as it keeps growing. It begins to stand up revealing a fully formed head, which from it comes a mouth, nose, and eyes. And just when you think it couldn't get any more terrifying, 
it lays down on the ground and from its torso bursts another being of its kind. The newly birthed being looks at the one it came from as they stare into each other's eyes. And in the end they hold hands as they harrowingly gaze forward, leaving us to wonder just what will come next. And finally, the last episode ends with the word help, as seen earlier, with a song about helping other people playing in the background. Oh, a doctor is a person who gives help each and every day. If you like to help people, then being a doctor is A-OK. And that's all of the episodes out currently. There will definitely be more as there's still so much open ends and questions that aren't answered. And it just feels like the story has so much more to give, which I'm very hyped about. But for now, that finishes my quick analysis on the entire series so far. Uh, I hope you enjoyed. First time ever doing something like that. Uh, thank you so much, obviously, to Mr. Manicor for making this entire series in the first place. I obviously couldn't do this video without him, so thank you so much to him. Um, definitely go support his videos, leave a like and subscribe, comment and do all that, because he really deserves it. But now for the fun part, theory time. I have three major theories that I haven't seen anywhere yet that I really wanted to share to others as I really think I could be right. Also I guess because there aren't too much, if any, videos about the Ningen series yet aside from reaction videos, so I figured I should get the ball rolling with this one and hopefully make people talk about this great series more. So straight into theory one. The Adam and Eve theory. This also serves as the foundation for theories 2 and 3. It's really just one big theory split into three different parts. But for this one, let's take a look at the horrifying scene we just watched. And I'm sorry to put you through this again. But I noticed immediately after seeing this that it's very similar to the story of Adam and Eve. You're all probably familiar with that story from the Bible already, so I'm not gonna really explain it. But to compare, from the red mass, a humanoid is formed, and from its torso comes another, serving as its partner. Just as God made Adam, and from his rib came Eve. Now, I thought that was about it. A cool parallel to be drawn between the two stories, the beginning of man in one, and the beginning of a new stage of Ningen in the other. But then I thought, well, because the stories are so similar to each other, too similar even, what if this isn't just symbolism, but an implication? What if these beings from the Red Mass don't just look human, they are human? After all, they have been teasing this the entire time with Are we their warm children? Our mythologies were their mythologies and ancestor of cannibalism. And how the terms Ningen and human are always so interchangeable. And why they chose the term Ningen in the first place, which literally means human in Japanese. Maybe again, because we don't just look like them and they look like us but we literally are them and they are us. We are biologically the same species as them. We are the next stage of Ningen evolution. Stage five, which is humankind as we know it. So with that being said, if we know this is how humans are formed and notice how purposefully similar it is to the Adam and Eve story, what if this is how Adam and Eve were truly created in this world? What if they came from and are themselves Ningen? But the more I thought about it, the more it sort of didn't make sense. Adam and Eve were made by God and didn't just come from nothing. So how can these type 5 Ningen be the first to exist if they required a type 4 to be born? A type 4 couldn't have been God because it would require the fusion of many people, animals, or maybe even a structure like the Professor Zubov at first. It can't exactly represent God as it can't be the first being to ever exist in the universe. I may have just debunked my own theory. Until I remembered, oh shit, predeterministic time travel exists here. Alright, you see, we're getting back to the crazy stuff I mentioned earlier, okay, as I promised. So, I think that God is a time-traveling Ningen from the future who created humanity, which then led to his own creation, which then led to him going back in time to start humanity all over again. A time loop. But another hole in the theory. How can the Ningen exist if humans are the first to be created? How can stages 1 to 4 exist in 1990 when the first beings ever created are at stage 5 already? I may have just debunked my own theory again. Except I haven't. I think, with enough watching over and over and thinking and insanity, I found out the evolution cycle of the Ningen. So, let me explain. 
This is me rubbing my hands right now. I made all of this up myself and I'm very proud to share it to you all. And I'm excited to see your thoughts if you believe them or not. So let's get into it. Let's start by assuming that the Mountain Corpse, or Icarus 1, is the same as the Stage 1 Ningen. It forms from a fusion of multiple animals, turning itself into a creature. To get to Stage 2, I think they'd have to keep fusing with even more creatures like themselves until it eventually evolves. And the reason I say this is because, if we take a look again at the legend of the Gasha Dokuro, of which the Stage 2 is very similar to, or perhaps even based upon, they are formed from the bones of hundreds of victims together into one mass. So a stage 1 would probably need to fuse with hundreds of other creatures to then evolve to a stage 2. Or maybe just 50 if it eats other stage 1s as one of them kind of equals 2 people, I don't know, whatever. Now for stage 3, it's not exactly explained what causes the evolution. What I think is that it needs to consume even more creatures than it already has. As looking again at the skeleton spectre in the artwork, it doesn't seem to be done attacking others yet, as maybe it still needs more bodies to evolve into the next stage. But whatever the case is, it's outright confirmed that a stage 3 comes from a stage 2 shedding its head and arms and becoming a floaty spine thingy. That floaty spine thingy will then fuse with a structure similar to the Icarus 3 and the Professor Zubov to then become a human factory or a stage 4. That stage 4 will then birth stage 5s or humans as we saw, but now, what is stage 6? Well, let's take one last look at the Icarus story. Back to that weird scene where the human wishes to go beyond and just shifts into a whale out of nowhere. Funniest thing I've ever seen. Well, that's what I think is a stage 6. A stage 5 human with the wish to go beyond transforms themselves into an animal. Yes, this implies that all animals are a descendant of humanity and are the exact same race as human beings and Ningen. What a terrifying thought. It reminds me of all the different species from all tomorrows who were all once human and turned into these animal creatures who still remember remnants of their human life. Absolutely terrifying. This would also I guess explain the whale just talking out of nowhere. It retained some of its intelligence and knowledge of language from its human life in its stage 6 form. Now to move on to the final stage though, a stage 6 animal would have to still wish to go beyond and fuse with another animal who also wishes to go beyond, just like in the Icarus story, which would then lead to the creation of a stage 1 Ningen. It all loops back to stage 1, a cyclical evolution. You could even change the numberings of the stages around and it would still make sense. The humans could be stage 1 and the human factory could be stage 6 if you wanted to. And it would still make sense as it all loops back into itself no matter where you start, just like a circle. Again, my mind blew when I pieced this together. No idea if it's right at all, but I feel pretty confident in myself. Also, it would just be so cool if it were real. I've never seen any creature in fiction evolve this way. Terrifying, but so unique and fascinating. Once again, reminded me of All Tomorrows, where the Q experimented on humanity, leading them to become all these different horrific forms which would understandably cause them to hate the Q, but as time moves on, they all may or may not eventually evolve to become the Q themselves. Pretty cool. Now, a hole I found in this theory though, is that how would the Ningen start with only Adam and Eve? Two just simply aren't enough, as to get to a type 2 Ningen alone would be impossible, needing to consume multiple creatures to evolve. Now, a pretty fun explanation I made that ties into the creation myth as well, is well, Adam and Eve actually aren't the first to exist as we're led to believe. Let me explain. In Genesis of the Bible and the story of creation, God created birds, sea creatures, and land animals way before he created man. And if we apply that to our Ningen story, it's possible that God created countless other Ningen before he ever made Adam and Eve. And that's how they were able to multiply. Two questions remain with this theory though. One would be that if there's so many animals in the world, why don't they just evolve? Well, I think that's the case because they simply don't wish to go beyond anymore. Or maybe also because they can't find a suitable partner who also wishes to evolve just like them. Probably too horrified by what they've become and too afraid to continue. Because if being an animal is bad, what more is being a Ningen? Which is pretty sad to think of. <laughs> but maybe they're content with being animals. I don't know. I've always wanted to be a wolf when I was a kid. The second question is that there would still be way too many animals and humans on Earth. 
They can all be once part of the Ningen cycle, right? And how about human and animal reproduction that can't just like not exist in this world? So how do you fit that into this theory? Well, I'm going to be answering that in theory 3, but allow me first to explain theory 2 so you can get a better idea of what I think is happening before we go complete conspiracy theorist mode in the end. <laughs> so theory 2, the god of humanity. Now that I've explained Adam and Eve and a little bit of God as again I think he's a Ningen from the future who is at the same time a descendant of and parent to Adam and Eve and is also his own great 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 great, great grandfather infinitely. Yeah, time travel is weird. But why is God doing this? What's his goal? Well, to find this out, I took quite a while actually. <laughs> Just scrolling through the entire series, trying to make sense of whatever the hell is happening. But eventually, I took a look at all of the Ningen species as a whole. And sort of questioned, what is it exactly that they do? Well, as we see in stage 6, the animal. Stage 1, the mountain Ningen. And stage 2, the Gashadokuro. Their main goal is to keep fusing and fusing with more and more creatures until they become a stage 3, then 4. Which creates entirely new Ningen in the form of stage 5s, which then turns into stage 6 to repeat the whole process and you get the gist. I noticed that the main theme I'm getting from them is that they want to keep fusing and fusing and then create more of themselves so that even more of them can fuse with other creatures. And with that, I think that their end goal is to keep fusing until every single living creature becomes one super organism. Not unlike the monument mythos is Alcatraz Island, which basically its entire goal is to keep multiplying itself and then fuse the entirety of America into one like being just completely made of biomass. But anyways, why would the Ningen want to do something like that? Well, we'll get into the exact reason on Theory 3. Uh, forgive me again, we're gonna get there soon, I promise. But for now, I think they're doing this to reunite all of humanity into one and create God. I've explained what I believe to be all six types of Ningen, but I left out a certain type that I think exists outside of a typical Ningen's life cycle. And that is God, the Type 7 Ningen. First off, I believe this is what his appearance looks like, as in each episode we get a different logo symbolizing a different Ningen that's seen within it. For episode 2, we saw a logo of a whale, which is a stage 6, um, theoretically. <laughs> and for episode 3, we saw a ship, which if it's representing Icarus 3, is stage 4. So what the hell is in episode 1, the humanoid figure submerged in water? We don't see any Ningen like it in this episode, except we may have heard of one. Remember when Keizo was stuck in the snow and heard a deep voice calling his name, and when he saw it, he describes it as being just a man. Well that lines up with the logo of episode 1, and with the man having a sort of echoey and divine voice and image appearing to just be pure light, also paired with the fact that he just shows up once and dips, not ever being mentioned again, leads me to believe that this is a plot point they'll get back to way later on in the series. Um, I have seen a few comments that refer to this um, thing that Keizo is talking to as uh, Icarus 1 or the Mountain Ningen, but in my opinion, I don't think that is because I think they would have just shown the Ningen or at least it's like silhouette, it's shape um, in this scene right here. But instead they chose to like show a picture of like glowing light like emitting from someone or something I don't know but what else would be the only thing glowing with white light the humanoid figure in the logo so I think that it could be the mountain corpse I might be wrong but I think that the logo is representing this dude whoever this is and all of those facts combined made me think that maybe this could be God or the type 7 Ningen in my crazy ass theory that may not seem so crazy anymore that now that I've explained it. Not as crazy, I wish. I think that what God is doing in this scene in particular is going back in different points of time to assure his existence in the future. So that the time loop never changes and God, who in my theory is the fusion of all humanity, remains alive. Now, how I think God time travels is pretty interesting. When we look back at the Icarus story, the man winds up back in time after going too far into the depths of the ocean. So I think that there's something going on with the bottommost point of the ocean, where it becomes sort of like the quantum realm in Avengers. Basically, you enter it and exit at different points in time. Now, types 1 to 6, I think, cannot survive doing this. As we see when the man, who is a type 1, dives in, he immediately ends up dead on the other end. Maybe because of the absolutely crushing pressure found at that depth. 
possibly so strong that it can even warp time itself. And the only being capable of entering and surviving, in my opinion, would of course be God. He's the only one strong enough to enter and exit these time portals and survive, which would, in theory, allow him to time travel from the end of time back to the start in order to restart humanity and then travel through different points in time throughout history to assure that he still exists and nothing changes. How fucking cool is that? Uh, also, one last cool thing I'd like to add before we move on to the next part. Um, I noticed too, it would make sense that this figure we see is God because in the Bible, he created man in his shape or in his image and likeness, which is basically our humanoid shape. We are like the same shape as God. So anyways, in the Ningen story, it would make sense that in this world that God would create humans in his image. And that's why this thing that Keizo sees that he describes as being just a man, which is also glowing, really bright, and has like an echoey divine voice, I think could be God, who again, made us look like him, made us in his image, the humanoid shape. Okay, but if that didn't get you, maybe this one will. So, again, we don't see this Ningen's face at all, just basically glowing light. And if you look at the Bible, there's a verse where God's talking and he says, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Boom. So maybe that's why it's like shining glowing light everywhere, because cause if he doesn't do that, whoever sees him could probably die. I guess you're only able to see his shape, that's why um, Keizo was able to see that he was just a man. Because if he saw any more, he would have probably died. That really strengthens the theory that this thing is God. I've, I really believe it somehow. Very out there, but I really do believe it. Okay. One last, last detail I just want to mention. A similarity to Monument Mythos. I know there's a lot of them, but Air Force One Angel is this white glowing being made up of lots of people. So maybe this Ningen could have took inspiration from that and is made of lots of people and is also a glowing humanoid being. Okay, that's then. That's all I've got. <laughs> okay, I hope you're still with me so far and haven't gone mad yet like I have. But now it's finally time for my third major theory, which ties all of these theories together. The serpent and the fruit. This theory was caused by an afterthought I had after coming up with the Adam and Eve theory. I thought, well, if there's an Adam and Eve and God, they had to have been in the Garden of Eden, right? It just made sense to me that if those existed in the story, then the Garden should exist too. So I was like, oh cool, maybe the Garden of Eden, or the origin of humanity, is in Antarctica. Hence why it seems to be the hotspot of all Ningen activity. Okay, okay, cool. But then another afterthought came, which was, wait, if we have Adam, Eve, God, and the garden, shouldn't there also be the apple or the forbidden fruit and a serpent who tempts Adam and Eve to stray from God? Then I was like, nah, this can't be. Like, how could I possibly make <laughs> this make sense this time? But with the tinfoil hat, a brain with a few screws loose, and way too much free time on my hands, I came up with this theory, or uh, kind of story, fan fiction rather, on what the apple and the serpent could have been in this story. I say fan fiction, but I kind of actually believe it to be true for now, unless debunked of course by next episodes. But here you go. Firstly, God creates the Ningen, and they're designed to just be, to exist forever and ever in an endless life cycle, where everything is peaceful and pure. No differences, no conflict, only unity, as they live their simple lives in the Garden of Eden. Sounds like a paradise, doesn't it? But apparently it wasn't enough for the serpent, who, for the sake of matching the Bible's actual serpent, is also a snake in this story, one of the many forms of a stage 6 animal Ningen. The serpent couldn't imagine living billions, trillions, infinite years of the same thing over and over without a single change. He didn't find any meaning in being a part of this never-changing, infinite cycle. He wanted more. He wanted to separate himself from God and the cycle of Ningen and take as many people as he can with him. As he knew, he wasn't the only one thinking this way. So he approached Eve and to her he offered a fruit. But what fruit was it? Well, stay with me here. <laughs> I think that the fruit was the knowledge of the ability to reproduce outside of the Ningen cycle, aka Schmix. This was the way to break free from the cycle of God and the Ningen, to stray away from them and create their own cycle where they can create their own rules. Eve was tempted by the serpent and told Adam to partake of the fruit with her. And so they did, creating Cain and Abel through childbirth, becoming the first ever humans. Some animals followed their ways as well, bearing their own children instead, 
breaking free from the influence of the Ningen cycle and casting themselves away as Adam and Eve did. And with the fruit beginning to be partaken in by more and more, the serpent's plan had succeeded. He has turned people away from God and the Ningen's order, but in turn has created chaos. The serpent and his people finally knew freedom, but along with it came suffering. Now, God and the Ningen try to fuse all beings back together to restore their order, while the serpent and his people try to break free from it. Eventually, the people of the serpent, or the normal humans and animals as we know of today, largely outnumbered the Ningen, as they became unknown to man, remaining in the Garden of Eden, or Antarctica. But the war between these two factions still remains, one trying to break free from an ancient absolutist order that restricted their freedom, and the other trying to bring back their lost brethren, referring to their action of fusing as help to those who strayed away from them, taking us beyond our current state of evolution, and considering themselves as our saviors. Their secret war continues in the Antarctic, when the Ningen are investigated by the Japanese Office for Human Studies. How did you like that theory? <laughs> the longest, farthest reach in existence, but it somehow makes some sort of sense. And I really believe it's possible, despite how crazy and out there it is. And it also gives a pretty cool meaning to the story. God and the Ningen could represent the concept of order and the humans, chaos. Both eternally fighting, yet also being the reason for each other's existence. Humans break free from the cycle only to wonder what's beyond becoming the Ningen and therefore part of the cycle they once broke free from, but also God creating this cycle eventually causes the serpent and humanity to exist, breaking the cycle he once created. Not just a literal endless time loop, but also an endless conceptual loop of two forces battling one another, but also being unable to exist without each other. Also, as man wanting to go beyond kind of being the start of all this transformation stuff, the whole cycle thing could be a metaphor for us wanting more and more and never being content with what we have, endlessly chasing what we can never get. The cycle could be an allegory for desire, knowledge, or the desire of knowledge. Once again, similar to the monument mythos. I hate to keep bringing it up so much times, but I just can't help but compare because there's so much similarities between them, I think. The desire for more could be the same conceptually as the special trees in monument mythos. Basically, these like powerful forces that aren't exactly good or evil, um, they're neutral, but when you tamper with it or mess with it too much, it leads to all of this messed up stuff happening. And um, I watched Wendigoon's uh, second part of Monument Mythos explanation, and he really explained it well. He describes the special trees as being like electricity. Um, electricity isn't good or evil, it's neutral, it can't think for itself. Um, and it could be beneficial, but if you use it the wrong way, could get shocked and could get hurt and that's similar to going beyond in my opinion it takes humanity to different heights um it's the reason we have really good technology today that can save multiple lives and make life way easier but if we go beyond too much um just like uh, i'm not saying whether these are good or bad uh, as of right now but just that it could lead to things we can't fathom as of now um, basically things like AI, artificial intelligence, um, cloning, human and animal, uh, resurrecting dead species, and uh, transhumanism, um, becoming cyborgs or robots, like implanting our consciousness into a machine. It could all benefit us in some way, but it also could lead us to a very bad place if left unchecked. So I think that that's a theme that's being told in this Ningen story as well with um, going beyond being the root of all this like Ningen stuff. Also unrelated but pretty interesting parallel I noticed that um, the fruit of both stories is something that God created but forbidden to be partaken in. The fruit from the tree of knowledge was created but forbidden to be eaten as it would disobey God's order. And in the Ningen story or the theory I made at least, the act of Shmex was built into the human and animal sages of Ningen but forbidden to be done as it would break free from the cycle. That is trippy as fuck. <laughs> I have no fucking clue how I was able to formulate all of those from one singular scene. It's scary what my brain can do. <laughs> but anyways, those are my three big theories. Adam and Eve being real, what God is and what his plan is, and the endless war of the serpent and God. Now, as if those weren't enough, <laughs> I came up with smaller final theories that sort of base off of those big three. 
to close off this video and to just give you some more interesting thoughts before the next episode comes out. And hopefully I uploaded this video in time so you have time to speculate before the fourth episode comes out completely demolishing all theories I've made. The first of those theories is that there's a secret human party trying to assist in bringing the Ningen back. Now for this one, we go all the way back to Takuyasha. If you remember her story that I said to keep in mind earlier, her father launched a rebellion, failed, and now she's trying to continue that rebellion. Now again, when we line up the art and the illustration on the Professor Zubov, Takuyasha lines up perfectly with the Axeman. That's what I'm calling him now. Now if we apply Takuyasha's story to the Axeman, if we take into account the three crazy ass theories I just mentioned, we can draw some parallels between them. The Axeman's ancestors, being the Ningen, launched a rebellion against mankind, which are now the new rulers of the world, trying to fuse them all together again, but failed. There's no actual rebellion event in the story, but I take the friendly description seen a while ago, and the possibility of Ningen being responsible for the story of the Gashodokuro as them still trying to attack and fuse with people present day. But back to Axeman. Now he's trying to continue his ancestors' rebellion, possibly by provoking the Ningen and causing them to attack and fuse with other people as seen in the illustration. Um, his entire faction could also be the party that's tampering with these sort of films we see which are meant to warn people of how dangerous the Ningen can be, but layered on top of them are texts saying completely otherwise that the Ningen are friendly and that you don't have to worry about them. Could be them. That's pretty much it for this one. It's possible that there's other humans siding with the Ningen trying to aid in the return. It's so cool being able to speculate all that again with just one scene where he compared the two artworks together. Mr. Manicor is an absolute genius. Next theory. The time cycle is not a cycle, but a spiral. Now with this one, I thought, well, what if the time travel here isn't just pure determinism, where everyone really is trapped in the loop as it's a circle, but that people can struggle just enough to change the littlest of things, altering the timeline not in a major way, but in some way nonetheless. Again, making it like a spiral instead of a circle, with small things changing as the loop continues over and over. Although events happen repeatedly lots of times, they're never truly the same each time. Kind of giving hope for the series and raising the stakes a little bit. It's more intense when you know it's on the main character's hands to change things compared to when you know what's gonna happen and can't really do anything about it. Now, I came to this theory because looking at Takuyasha, later on in her story in Japanese Legend, she's actually unable to ever continue her father's rebellion and the people who oppose her end up winning. So if we line that up with our Axeman, does that mean him and the Ningen will end up losing to the people? So if that happens, how can God and the cycle continue to exist? We don't know. Maybe it could cause a time paradox and that could be the one way to truly defeat the Ningen. Timey wimey stuff really doesn't seem out of the question after the Icarus story. And actually speaking of, maybe the mountains looking different isn't because he's in a way distant past, but because some small thing in the timeline changed altering the appearance of the mountain. Again, a small detail, but a lot of those small details combined can alter the timeline. Pretty interesting, and it could give humanity a lot of hope if true. Next theory, and um, this is uh, another just crazy out there one. Inanimate objects are humans too. Yep, I mean every single object that is inanimate is also part of the Ningen species. I thought of this one while thinking of the Adam, Eve, and God theories. Because I was thinking of the creation myth, I wondered if the god of the Ningen also created light, water, the stars, and the earth. I was thinking how the hell that could be possible. We'll answer that in a bit, but my train of thought in thinking of an answer for that eventually landed on Icarus II, fusing with the Professor Zubov. I realized how unique this stage of evolution was. Like, unlike any other stage that would require other creatures to be fused with, this one required an inanimate object being a ship. That's strange. Unless inanimate objects are people too. But oh, it doesn't end there. I think Professor Zubov could have once been a guy too. Think about it. The words help aren't created by crewmates. The letters themselves aren't made of spray paint, as read out by Hugo, because spray paint doesn't become that, like, shade of brown. Uh, also, how would the Ningen know Russian? Unless this ship was once a Russian dude that turned himself into a ship that says help all over it. That is a weird sentence. Or you know, he could have just been assisted by like the axe man in his faction. I don't know. Could be that. <laughs> it's also able to fuse with another Ningen. And as far as I know, Ningen can only fuse with other Ningen. 
Also, come on, it's named Professor Zubov. We all thought it was a dude at first. I'm not alone in this one. I've seen other comments about it too. So maybe that was intentional to sort of like confuse you. If Is it a dude? Is it a ship? Uh, maybe the dude became a ship. Or maybe it's just a stretch and the name means nothing at all because they're just drawing from real life. Uh, from the real Professor Zubov ship that actually exists that uh, also interestingly went to Antarctica in real life. Uh, but anyways, assuming my crazy theory is right and that every uh, inanimate object is indeed human, if we apply my God theory to this one, God is not only the fusion of all living organisms, but of all inanimate objects too. So literally everything. He wouldn't even need to cross the time portal as he is the time portal. But how would one turn into an inanimate object though? Well, I put them here on stage 6 of the Ningen evolution. Basically humans who wanted to go beyond but instead of being animals and like contributing to the cycle, they said, fuck it, boat. Just a funny mental image, God makes the first ever Ningen in the cycle and he's like, nah, I ain't doing this, light. Then followed by even more people who are like, nah, I ain't with this shit either, universe. If this theory is true though, it wouldn't be out of place for Mr. Mandicore, cause like 90% of the monument mythos are things that appear inanimate at first, actually turning out to be people. But real or not though, just imagining this concept alone is terrifying. Um, imagine the pillow you sleep on, the clothes you wear, the water you bathe in, the roof over your head, the meal you just ate, those are all made up of human material. What the fuck? Uh, the perfect example of do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, but instead of talking about other people, it's talking about literally everything because everything is somehow a dude. Um, also really reminds me of the short story of the egg where, god that's a really long story, but uh, basically you are the same as every other person in the entire world. That's also you. So like it really emphasizes this uh, quote that I just said. Uh, you gotta be nice to other people because they're literally you. So that's kind of what this reminded me of. And one last thing that I wanted to add to this part is that maybe if every inanimate object really is a human, that's why Keizo referred to Antarctica as a woman. Uh, referring to Antarctica, he said that her snow covered me like a mother's womb. Obviously, that's like a metaphor or whatever that's called. Uh, personification, rather. But if we look at it in this context where Antarctica might be, I don't know, once a woman, uh, that now changes things by a lot. Just imagining everything that's around you being human, again, is just a crazy idea. But that's all I have for this one. And finally, my last theory. The end of my incoherent blabbering is within sight, my friends. It's that Icarus 2, in some timey-wimey way, is actually Hugo Funatsu. If the Icarus 1 really is Keizo or has Keizo in it, hence its name, Icarus 2 could be Hugo as, if you remember, its nickname was removed out of respect to the Funatsu family. If it was any other Funatsu, there wouldn't be any problem with just name dropping them then and there. But I think the reason it's hidden to us for now is because it's in some way Hugo and that'll be like a big plot twist in a future episode. I mean, it has to be him, he's the only other Funatsu. This does conflict with what I said earlier, being that God is the only one who can cross time portals and live. But it could be that God sort of opened the portal for Hugo to pass through and survive. But if that's possible, then now any time you want me thing is possible. I don't even want to think. I don't even want to. I don't even want to begin to think of that. But back to Hugo. If he really is Icarus 2, uh, whom I actually forgot to mention earlier that the Japanese text of Icarus 2 says predator. And with all the cannibalism stuff um, that I've explained, uh, fusing with other fellow people, this kind of fits in. Uh, but anyways. He could have wanted to fuse with a Professor Zubov to be reunited with his father as he read about Keizo being there all the way back. But maybe being in this primal Ningen state where I guess like the Ningen genes would kick in and like you'd have the desire to keep fusing and fusing. As like in my theory that's kind of like their main purpose. He isn't able to control himself and ends up creating the human factory. Then maybe after surviving that, Keizo goes mad and starts acting differently possibly influenced by the presence of a Ningen. He now gained the desire to evolve to become a human factory himself, explaining why he said that he wants to have a son, the same human factory he saw that drove him mad. Who knows? <laughs> okay, hello, feature me here, and you've made it to the end of the video already. But I just wanted to add a few last things that I wasn't able to fit into the rest of the video um, before I give you to the outro. Um, I'm just over here time traveling, fixing up. 
uh, the timeline, um, editing, adding voice lines, removing voice lines, and um, talking about things I that I forgot to talk about. So, here's the first one. Um, first of all, I saw a comment that says that Icarus won when he went deeper instead of going into the ocean. Uh, he actually went above land, which would make sense. Um, from our perspective, it looks like he keeps going down and down, but when you're underwater, you could be upside down and the water could have this reflection thingy that makes it look like a cliff, but kind of not. Do you know what I'm talking about? So yeah, that, that is a valid explanation that he first goes deeper into the ocean, becomes a Ningen, uh, comes back up, and then dies because he can't survive. Something like that. Um, next one is a hole that I found, and it's where does God go after he time travels back to the past? Because if you think about it, if he travels back to the past, he needs to have died or disappeared. Or else, if he lives long enough, there's going to be two gods at the same time, which I don't think that's possible. So what I think is he's created at the end of time and then goes back in different points of history to assure his existence. And once he's done with that, he goes back all the way back in time and then he shatters himself into multiple people or Ningen that then form the universe, the Ningen species as we know it, and all of that. Um, I guess that would conveniently get rid of God so that there aren't just two of them walking around. Um, but then eventually, because of that um, explosion, Big Bang he made, he then led into his own existence. So, cycle doesn't change. Next one I wanted to point out, uh, mon more monument mythos similarities. Uh, these are the last ones, I promise. You're at the end of the video. One, uh, spine-shaped serpent in the sky uh, being an antagonist. Uh, also very similar to a horned serpent in monument mythos. Um, and also that same spine serpent um, being kind of a severed limb that grows giant and then floats on its own, um, being like its own powerful engine. Reminds me of the canyon crowns from Monument Mythos, which are like basically severed heads that just like the spine grew giant and can float around and kind of like act like engines. Um, used in machines by Rockefeller and Elon Musk. That's a weird sentence again. Now, uh, what else? Oh, there's um, Keizo in his like voice recording in episode one mentions that Will spots him. And I looked up who Will is and I think he's referring to Will Steger. If that's how you say his name. Um, he's a real life Antarctic explorer who went with Keizo to, to um, that whole expedition that they did in real life. So that's pretty cool. We could see him make a return as a character in this series. Oh yeah, I saw another comment that says at some point in episode 1, they switch from... Okay, so basically Japanese has like different uh, sort of ways of writing. Uh, there's hiragana, katakana, and kanji. And the comment says that uh, people's names are usually written in kanji, but then at some point in the video, um, they use Keizo's name written in katakana, which the comment says is usually reserved for animals. And kind of thinking about the whole Ningen cycle loop thing, it does make sense that they like refer to Keizo as being an animal. Because again, like we're all, in my theory, we're all animals, humans, Ningens, we're like all alike. Uh, human terms, animal terms uh, can get switched around. And it would still mean the same thing, just like the terms Ningen and human. That's just what I think. Uh, an uh, another piece of proof that I found that proves this Ningen cycle theory is that it, for, at first it teases that we're their warm children or like their warm descendants, warm-blooded descendants. So if we come down from them, like we're descendants from them, how can them making us Ningen take us to a higher level in humanity? If we descend from them, which is going down, how can them making us like them be referred to as evolving or going up. Do you know what I mean? So the only way I could make sense of that is again if it's a circle. You kind of are going up and down the evolution line at the same time at that point. Just another point that um, can support that theory. Uh, last one. Uh, I see I've seen people refer to monument mythos as like Evangelion because it's like a series that isn't very narrative or dialogue heavy. It's just basically events uh things happen that are supposed to like make you feel a certain way it's like the vibes that you get um not really one that you need to know all of the details of but something that you just need to like feel out which is basically what evangelion is um you can't really make sense of anything that's happening there i watched all of it <laughs> and still don't know what the hell is happening 
but I felt what was happening, you know? Like, I felt I understand the meaning, and I think that's the point of the series. But now I bring this up because I was thinking of that one quote and in episode one. It says, Hell is real and it's cold, and what happens when it's warm? So I was thinking, if all the ice caps melt, doesn't this, like, flow all of the Ningen out into, the, into our world? So I was thinking, like, Evangelion, that could be, like, the third impact event, or just, like, this event that would doom the whole world, and that would be really cool to watch and scary t- and terrifying at the same time but i would love to watch it basically there might be like a world ending event uh coming up in the next episode that'll be really cool it's just a prediction i'm making right now um the whole last 30 minutes 40 minutes of this video is all just predictions and theories and if you've made it this far thank you so much um i'm done blabbering now i think i got everything out of the way Oh, one last thing. Um, uh, uh, this thing in series also reminds me and others of Evangelion because if you watch the anime, there's like certain scenes there where they're like investigating like supernatural stuff and then there's basically this white glowing being that uh, causes the first impact or basically uh, where the world started changing from there. Anyways, Antarctica researchers, white glowing figure. Antarctica researchers, white glowing figure. Okay, pretty cool similarity. Okay, I'm just kidding. One last thing. Um, In Evangelion, the angels, uh, the alien things also share DNA as humans, which really fits this series. Okay, I'm done for real. But, okay. uh, That was the most unhinged part of the video. This is just me talking now. This is uh, very scriptless. So, I'm going to be sending you to the outro now. Thank you so much for watching. Take it away. But for now, fortunately for all of us, that's all I got for this video. I'm officially out of crazy ass theories, for today at least. I hope you all enjoyed! Another great series by Mr. Manicor that just leaves so much to your imagination. Like exactly my kind of stuff. I love it. I also adore how he takes real life myths like Icarus, Takuyasha, and now Adam and Eve and sort of recontextualizes them to like fit into his story to make it all one big narrative with where all these different stories around history are connected somehow. Just as he did in Monument Mythos where different events in America are all actually connected with these crazy monsters, parallel universes, and time travel. Very similar to this one but so different and unique at the same time. Uh, uh, what else is there? Oh, the, the Ningen cycle theory I guess also took inspiration from my own um, real life conspiracy theory that I don't really believe in, I just made it for a video because I thought it was an interesting thought. Um, it's called the cycle of humanity where basically uh, humans are made by God who shatters himself into these different pieces of the universe. Uh, then these humans continue to evolve so much until they fuse everything into one great being, which is basically God who will then shatter himself again to make another universe and so on and so on. So very interesting that um, this series could possibly be be just like that theory I made like around last year. Pretty cool. Uh, creating this took very long and would appreciate it if you could show support, be it a comment, a like, a subscribe, whatever. I used to not ask for those things, but spending all this time on one video, I now kindly ask that you show support if you enjoyed the video. I really appreciate it. Um, it was quite stressful to make, but I had so much fun making it. Like the fun definitely outweighed the stress. My first time ever making an analysis and theory video on analog horror um, even made harder and uh, funner by the fact that nobody else has really covered this series yet so I'm very happy to do it. We may see more series covered in the future, who knows, but for now I'm tired and that's all I got. I still got Tears of the Kingdom to get back to. Got 90 hours in that and I'm still not halfway. Anyways, (laughs) thank you very much if you made it this far, I really appreciate it. Thank you for just interacting with this video at all. It means so much to me. But yeah, I guess I'll be seeing you all next time. Thanks again for watching and goodbye.